Welcome everyone to the Watchman Privacy Podcast. I'm very pleased today to be speaking to Hervoye Morich, who is the host of the Geopolitics and Empire podcast, which is an excellent show. He also hosts um, a segment in TNT Radio. We'll get him to explain some of this stuff in a moment. He's also a bit of a world traveler, an independent researcher, former adjunct professor, and a serious advocate of holding back global tyranny in all its forms. Welcome, Foray. Uh, have I missed anything in that uh, description? No, you got it more or less, and it's uh, great to be with you, Gabriel. Let's first start with geopolitics and empire. You on that show, which is an excellent show, I would encourage people listening to go check it out. You host and interview what I would call dissident thinkers, certainly people who go against the grain. What would you say is the the main theme of that show, and what can people expect when they watch it? You know, th things like that sometimes I think take a life of their own and uh, evolve. And I think you can see that with many folks, uh, you know, in this sphere. And I think that's a good thing. It's a natural thing. And I just started it out wanting to talk to <laughs> smart people and, and use them to help me figure out what in the heck is going on in the world. And I just, uh, for me, because I studied in Geneva diplomacy, Geopolitics for me was one of my favorite ways of seeing the world. I, I just kind of see it as a science of how things operate. You know, geopolitics, it takes into account the, the science of politics, uh, economy, geography, demographics, all, you know, economy, technology, culture, and an empire. I think, it, you know, it's always about world government. I think we may have touched on this in the past, the, the centralization of you know, the end game, the end goal is the centralization of power at the global level. Every history has sh shown us this. Every uh, empire, every emperor, his goal was to take over the planet. Uh, and so, you know, geopolitics and empire, that's my thing. And uh, I just try to talk to anyone who I think is interesting uh, as, uh, you know, credible people. Uh, but I, I go beyond the Overton window. In large part, there's most things that I won't have an issue with looking at. There are some things that I think are silly that I really that I go after really what interests me. So th that's about it. Yeah. Yeah. I, th I think you do a great job of getting different people in, but people who are not just way out there. And, and I don't have a problem with people who are way out there, but sometimes they're out there because it's just not very useful or as you said, very credible. And I, I should also mention, I have been on his show as well. So go and check that episode of Geopolitics and Empire for me talking about a, a thing that I don't usually talk about, which is privacy in the context of um, the last hundred years of US and British history. So Hervoye, who has been the most controversial person you've had on your show? Well, it would I guess it would be blowback from the powers that be. Um, the biggest episode that had been deleted was my interview with the author of the Bioweapons Act, which was signed into law by George Bush in 1989, Dr. Francis Boyle, who's at the University of Illinois, and you know his thesis that the thing going around the last couple of years was a biological weapon. And just anyone questioning the things you're not allowed to question, that that's it. And so that stuff get, got me banned from Patreon and, and PayPal and I'm sure shadow banned in all manner of uh, different ways. You talked about how the um, think that the Department of Homeland Security in the U.S. got you banned from PayPal. Um, you said that you got a letter one day that your account was being shut down. There wasn't really a reason that they gave. Has this put you on some kind of uh, blacklist, would you say? Well, with a lot of these things, you have to have the foundational understanding of what's going on. It's not like you're going to get a letter, an email that said, you know, from the DHS saying, you know, we did this. Right. And so it's sort of like having, as I feel I do, the foundational knowledge of history and uh, international relations, you know, both which I've studied and have degrees, but have experience meeting with interesting and credible and important people, both in person as well as on my shows. You, so you understand what's going on. And so it was April of 2022. The same, so it was the Department of Homeland Security, which rolled out in April the Disinformation Governance Board, and uh, which was going to be headed up by this Jankowitz lady, this wacky, wide-eyed lady. And this is basically the Ministry of Truth. I mean, in first instance, the DHS for me shouldn't even exist. 
it's a totalitarian apparatus agency uh, ministry that came as a result of 9-11. You know, none of this stuff should be existing in America. The TSA, the Patriot Act, the NDAA, the DHS, etc. And then, so, I mean, it really doesn't take much to put two and two together. The same week DHS rolls out this information, this information governance board, uh, you get Mint Press News and Consortium News, which are left-wing publications, which I do enjoy. I read when it comes to their analysis of you know geopolitics and foreign policy and that sort of stuff. And myself, all three of us specifically, and a few others, Caleb Maupin, uh, who's, um, I guess, a socialist who's on Russia today often, uh, the three or four of us specifically that same day or week, we all got an email from PayPal saying you're prohibited forever from using PayPal. And then a few months later, that was April 2022, uh, a couple months ago, some I, f- I forget the exact name, Freedom Foundation published further documentation, which showed that the DHS created some obscure, unaccountable agency called CISA, and that they were saying that Again, this is between the lines that anyone, U.S. citizens creating uh, disinformation in their eyes on social media were basically classified by CISA and or DHS as non-kinetic threats, which is like, wow, once you read this, like this is their actual policy. It's like I'm, I'm one step away from being like deemed legally an enemy of the state. And it went on to say that anyone carrying out this disinformation on social media is attacking the cyber infrastructure of the uh, U.S. government, according to the DHS or CISA. And then I figure, you know, then you kind of figure out, oh, okay, they deemed us as this non-kinetic threat. They shut off our PayPal's. That's what's uh, going on. So it's really, it's really, I mean, this is like Twilight Zone. It's very sinister and and not at all American in the um, understanding of America that. Um, most people, I hope, would 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 think of, and people really need to wake up. Yeah, and let me just add, you know, in when that happened in April, I actually got DMs on Twitter from Kim Iverson. I think most people will know; she's pretty well known in the media space. And and Matt Taibbi, you know, the famous uh, journalist, they both DM'd me, and they both uh, Kim actually used screenshots that I sent her with my name and my podcast um, from my PayPal letter email uh, on she was at the hill uh, at that time she had her show right before she quit and started her own kim iverson kim iverson show so they sort of covered uh my uh, deplatforming along with others have you experienced as a result any difficult border crossings let's say i don't know if you've been to the u.s since then but so i was uh where would it be two months ago less than two months ago uh i journeyed into the empire <laughs> to the u.s and i was Based on all of this that has been proceeding, that has been happening, I was anticipating something possibly happening at the border because I've had other guests on my TNT show like Dave Lindorf, who's a a classical sort of leftist journalist in his 70s now. And I was just using him and my experience as reference points. You know, the fact that now U.S. citizens or foreigners alike that enter um, through the, was it the Customs and Border Patrol? That they can have their electronic devices confiscated, uh, have all their content downloaded uh, from their electronic devices. If they say no, they can be confiscated. They can be held. I think at most you can be held for a couple hours or like half the day or the whole day or something at the border. And so, and in the case of Dave Lindorf, he wrote a hardcore piece for The Nation magazine like five years ago uh, discussing uh, the Pentagon's budget. Uh, for whatever reason, his investigation was like hardcore and it conflicted with what the Pentagon was actually saying. He found himself on the blacklist uh, the, the, where you get four S's on your boarding uh, pass from here on out. So he's on de facto on some uh, agency's blacklist. They don't even tell you who it is. So some agency out of the 16 plus national security agencies throw you on this list. And every time he travels back into the U.S., he is taken aside for extra screening you know for like an hour or something and he's trying to get him himself off that list but it's nearly impossible so i was just you know i was anticipating maybe having one of my electronic devices taken nothing happened i went in everything was normal but 
I wiped like my, you know, the email client that I used. I erased all the emails from my laptop, um, all, all any saved passwords, bookmarks. I put it on, you know, like an encrypted uh, file device. And I went in where even if they did find, take one of my devices, the most important information from my end uh, wouldn't be there. And then once I got to where I was going in the US, I just, you know, reinstalled uh, the content. So it's just crazy that I have to be thinking like this, you know, now as a US citizen. <laughs> yeah, it is. And, you know, you're, you're a US citizen, you grew up in Chicago, you've you've traveled around the world, but you are a US citizen, you have the US passport. But you know, <laughs> to speak to to question things to have some kind of inquiry makes you um, potentially uh, an enemy. It's it's absolutely absurd. I hope you'll you'll keep us aware of any difficult border crossings. Um, and we can all stick for, stick up for each other. I think that if people make a stink about it, that stuff might be less likely to happen. Uh, ha have you faced any other struggles being a content creator at this time? Uh, let me just add on that final point before I uh, join this call with you. I uh, finished recording a podcast interview with an analyst out in Brussels in Europe regarding Russia, and we were touching on this subject and he was saying he's he's he was in the soviet union in the 70s and 80s and that he sees america becoming soviet in that sense but it's still not nearly as bad as it was in the soviet union you get what i'm saying so yes we are becoming like the soviet union but we're still not quite there there's still he says an ample amount of freedom so i think you know we have to think about these things objectively without emotion and with the, uh, you know, with the nuance that yes, it's getting bad. My fear is that we're seeing the beginning steps. Th this could rapidly descend into all out, you know, Soviet Union system, or maybe our the powers that be want to sort of keep it at the brave new world level, you know, <laughs> but um, getting back to your question, the biggest thing is, like I mentioned, that big uh, interview that I had, if if we were allowed to organically grow in the digital space, you know, I I would have had a much I think bigger platform, and this just forces us to really double and triple down our efforts in terms of our workload. It's it's basically I'm forgetting now the guy who wrote the, in the Greek mythology that is it Sisyphus or he was rolling the the rock up the yeah yeah Sisyphus. And that's basically how it feels like as a content creator, because you, you keep getting the wind knocked from out, out of you, you know, like 2021, uh, I was leaving education and I was I, I wanted to start a business, the podcast, monetize it. And, you know, I started Patreon and because I'm in Mexico and it's in pesos, you know, you get it's not a lot to start out, but, you know, you have a long term vision. I, I'm not in this for the money. I'm not in this to make quick uh, cash. And, you know, I'm in the long term game. So I understand I opened the Patreon, you know, you start getting a thousand pesos uh, a month patrons. That's like what? Uh, 50 bucks. Right. And then two thousand pesos and then three and then four and then, you know, five, six, seven. You know, then you get a couple hundred bucks and then your goal is to build it until you get a couple thousand bucks that you can live on. And then, you know, Patreon cancels you. The wind gets knocked from you. And then you got to set up the subscribe star, you know, alternative. You got to scramble for alternatives. But each time you lose momentum. And uh, this inertia and some of the people that were on Patreon sub supporting you, they're not going to switch to Subscribestar. And then I set up my website, you know, uh, January 2022, integrate membership content. I paid a pay boatload of money to have the website created and then uh, set up the PayPal and Stripe as the processors. And what do you know? Four months later, PayPal gets blocked. And it's the same thing again. Um, a number of people who used PayPal they're not going to sign up again, you know, through Stripe. And then that's just how it goes. There's, there's no other real issue at the moment uh, other than it just seems overall almost like there's a shadow banning. Like I'm, I'm putting out the content on the podcast ecosystem on the five or six video platforms, you know, Brighteon, BitChute, uh, Rockfin, Rumble, YouTube, <laughs> Odyssey. And you're just throwing everything out there. And it seems like sometimes the numbers are, not so great. I wonder if they have some other way, you know, to, you, you never know out of the blue, I'll have a Brighteon video, get 10,000 views because Mike Adams, the owner of natural news shared it on, on his telegram or something. And the same thing will happen on different platforms. So it's basically, it's a long game. It's a guerrilla war. It's a war of attrition. 
and you just you just keep at it. And I totally know what you mean. I I think I put a ton of effort into this show, and you know it, it's still starting off, but I've had really good guests on. There's there's good editing. I'm constantly improving things, thumbnails, the website, etc. But I also see just kind of drips and drops when it comes to uh, increasing subscribers. And, and I'm doing all the things. I'm on all the platforms, trying to be active on social media and such. But still, there's definitely something. Uh, blocking the way more than more than just my my ineptitude um but uh yeah such as such as life so let's let's get into some of the the high level stuff then um oh by the way uh, what i was going to say is if you're listening to this realize that you really have to help us out um go to uh, go and subscribe to us and wherever you can review us rate us share us that's uh the really one of the only ways to break this Algorithm ghetto, as as Hervoye likes to use this this phrase by um, Edwin Black. You like to throw this question at all your guests on geopolitics and empire. So let me throw a, a version of it at you. What do you see as the the building empire, the next empire that's building in the world today? I see it as the final empire. Everyone is biased, and my my bias is my biblical worldview. You know, I think at some point there will be the end of history. I like that term better. It's less, uh, you know, freak, freaking out uh, as, you know, like the end end of the world, the end times. But, you know, the, the end of the world, the end times, the second coming of Christ, that, that is the end. That is the end of history, you know, because time exists only because death exists. Uh, once we are all our uh, immortal selves, there's no longer death. There's no longer time. You are in, in eternity. And so history has ended. And I, I view this all as a trajectory from the beginning of mankind's history. There's been this attempt by the dark, dark forces to take the planet. And, and it's like a successive wave each time. The different, you know, Babylonian Empire takes a certain portion, portion of the planet. Uh, and then each successive empire, Roman Empire, takes a bigger piece of the planet. And then, you know, the Holy Roman Empire and then the French Empire and then the British Empire, upon which the sun never set, right? Uh they were the biggest empire. And now, uh, you know, then the Nazis, uh, I believe Hitler was this occultist who wanted to take over Europe. And once he secured Europe, he was going to take over the, you know, the Americas and then the world. He failed. And then the American empire today. So each, you can kind of, if you picture this in your mind, they're getting closer and closer to what some call full spectrum dominance, you know, a, a true world empire, which uh, as a synonym, I'll use the term world government. Uh, global government. They also use global governance. And so I think th that's it. And that includes different elements. That includes total control of our bodies. You know, we've seen with the biosecurity state, I've had guests on who say the final frontier is is our is our biology, our body, our DNA, and, and, and our souls. And that's what they're trying to penetrate now with all this gene editing and obsession with DNA. And so it's you know, it's total control of the planet and uh, everything within it, uh, you know, uh, and the commodification. You know, I think there are um, valid criticisms of capitalism. That's not a perfect system. You have monopoly capitalism, as I was as I learned in Geneva, you know, hyper capitalism. Edward Lutwak, uh, we, we had to read a book from Edward Lutwak, the famed uh, analyst, uh, turbo capitalism. Now it's just just this extraction uh, of, uh, of everything on the planet for these global elites, you know, and, and our bodies. They want to they want to harvest us as energy. Basically, you can see in some of their patents. So, yeah, I feel like and this would be the final world empire, you know, when the, the, they can achieve it again. That's anybody's guess. But we're always moving closer and closer. And even just today, I was looking at the website biometric update. They said that the. Uh, the global estimate for people without ID it has been reduced to 850 million. So just three years ago, it was over a billion because they need you know ID and digital ID to establish this technocratic global control. So you can see you can see the advance uh, of this. Yeah, and my my audience is no strangers to things like CBDCs and biometric identities and. The World Economic Forum saying you'll own nothing and you'll be happy. Of course, just open your eyes. The last two years, what what people uh, gave up and gave into, and what happened as a result. It's you know it, it's easy to imagine the uh, the next step. Now, 
when you were talking about empire, I think there's some people listening who would not group the American empire or not think of it into the other evil empires that let's say that you mentioned, or they might not think of it as an empire. What would you, what's your kind of pitch for uh, people who think that America is out there doing good in the world? Again, I mean, I, I was raised as an American, and it wasn't until the 2000s that I realized studying history and all of this stuff, going down the rabbit hole, it's like, whoa, we, we're an empire. And, you know, one thing is mentioned before, a lot of my guests are very credible, are military people. Like on TNT, I recently interviewed U.S. Marine Corps disabled combat veteran Matthew Hawk, who's part of the Eisenhower Media Network. I think he ran for some political office. I mean, just he's one example. Many others will. They, they served their country. They were soldiers. They say we are an empire. And then if you look at it, just what I was saying earlier, the science of, of politics, geopolitics, if you study the data, the amount, uh, the systems that have been created since World War II, the Bretton Woods system, the IMF and the World Bank and the dollar world reserve and the size of the American military, uh, and then you study separately propaganda, all this. In, I mean, these are the things, the likes of which the world has never seen up until now. The This level of media propaganda that we have today. And that is what, you know, hides this idea of, of, of empire. We've all been propagandized. And that's why I snapped out of it. And you look, you know, there's almost a thousand American bases. I mean, that's. They say like officially there's seven to eight hundred, but then you've got other, you know, special ops, black ops, other bases in the history of the world. Please tell me what empire has had almost a thousand bases spanning the globe. I mean, uh, nobody system of control. You know, the John Perkins, the economic hitman, I've interviewed him twice. Uh, he's explained this. He was an economic hitman. He and basically they use the IMF and World Bank to force countries to to basically become a part of the U.S. economic imperial system, and you know w where they take on debt, and then they, they, of course, they're not supposed to pay off that debt, and then the collateral will be real war real resources from the target country, and, and then you know the, the Western American Empire will. That's how they will obtain then extract those resources from that target country without firing a shot. So then there's different ways the empire operates. Again, in history, that's been used before. You know, Roman, whatever empire in history has used military force. Sometimes they've been able to do it peacefully just by telling the you know, country they're going to invade, look, we're going to obliterate you. That's option one. Option two is give us what, what we want, pay tribute, and then uh, we won't obliterate you. And, you know, it's the same thing that goes on in different forms. So I, I can't understand how anyone can't understand that america is not an empire it's just it's it's like a chameleon over with technologies it's able to sort of hide some aspects of, of itself as you were describing the ways that the u.s is an empire you didn't even mention surveillance and and the things for example that became popularized with edward snowden's leaks what is your take on edward snowden and how do you think the U.S. and I guess the, the West, broadly speaking, got to the point where they're surveilling everyone. Well, it was born out of World War II. I think w wars are used to as means of rapidly in a short space of time developing high tech. You know these technologies, as you saw with World War One and World War Two. You get the atom bomb, and then the internet created if everything today. You know DARPA, DARPA internet, DARPA GPS. Uh, Facebook DARPA project. I, I think Google is a DARPA project. I wouldn't be surprised, you know, Microsoft and Amazon as well. Yeah, so all of that stuff came out of World War II. The the, technolo the technocratic, was it uh, ages, Brzezinski called it. And Snowden, I don't trust Snowden. <laughs> I, you know, it's interesting. He's everything he's promoted, uh, you know, Signal and all these other applications are basically coming from the open, I think it's called the Open Technology Fund, which is all financed by the U.S. government. And so, um, you know, Yasha Levin has written about this. So he's, he's a hardcore leftist. But again, you know, this is kind of my point earlier. I totally disagree with him on his social and cultural views. But 
you know, he's spot on when it comes to his analysis regarding the whole surveillance stuff with his book, Surveillance Valley, which I haven't even read yet. I've only <laughs> read snippets of it. It's been years. I don't even have time. It takes me years to catch up on books, but it's suspicious that Snowden promotes. Again, this is like another layer to the deception where he's promoting open technology fund projects, you know, Tor created by the U.S. Navy, uh, Signal, and all this other stuff. And I don't know if it's doing he's doing it wittingly or, or, or unwittingly, but it doesn't matter because the consequence is the same. You wonder if the Empire has some... They're much more sophisticated than us. They, they know better what makes us tick, and they're running all sorts of you know psychological and other information operations. So you know it, it could be that what Snowden did somehow benefited the, the Empire in terms of where they want to take us next. So there would have to be some revealing of what's going on. Maybe at some point it would just become too obvious, so they can then steer, you know, control the narrative and say, oh, you caught us. We're spying on you. Uh, ah, we've got these tools, you know, like the Open Technology Fund tools, which they've also financed. And we think it's private, but they still have access. You, you get what I'm saying? I don't know. There's different ways that this can go, but I don't quite trust uh, Snowden. No, that's fair enough. I, I don't think that any particular thing deserves our trust. The reason why I tend to recommend people to something like Signal or Tor is not because somebody's recommending it, but because it's open source, because I know people who um, can see what's what's going on behind the scenes because they hold up to audits. But I agree, it's absolutely important to be skeptical of things. And, and that's definitely a, a useful mindset. L let me ask you this about your, the privacy tools that you do rely on trust to some degree. W what are they? And how do you how do you decide to trust something? Clearly, when you go into maybe trying to trust something, it's there's some really high level stuff, some some deeper research that is involved at looking at the origin of some of these companies. So how, how do you evaluate your your privacy tools? Just on the previous point, um, well, just using Tor, as you said, as an example and signal, that may be the case that those tools are fine. I think another key point, just to add on everything that I was saying, that you see these tools now being used, it, it, everything comes together. You know, the goal is world government. And the CIA is a globalist. It's 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 not a national device. It's a globalist tool, whose whose goal now is, I mean, some people, some of my guests have traced the World Economic Forum to the CIA. Okay, and the CIA is running the color revolutions, which overthrow foreign countries. So they're plugging in all of these countries into this global Bretton Woods economic system, and and supranational sort of you know EU style system. So any country that's not part of it will be overthrown. And how do, how do they do it? They use color revolutions. Uh, what does that entail? The use of technologies like Signal and, and, and Tor. So they give these technologies to uh, the young folks in those, let's say, Iran, who will use Signal and Tor, which protect them from the Iranian surveillance. You, you, you see what I'm saying? There's many, There's it's, it's a really complicated and interesting pro process. So Signal and Tor may be, as you say, legit, but then they're being used to finalize the, the, the phases of world government. And then to get back to your question, I, I've, I view really bleak. Uh, I can't recall now the exact quotes, but I on my Telegram feed, I'm always posting news. And this was a few months back. Uh, basically, it's really not good in terms of trying to maintain personal sovereignty and, and, and privacy in this age. It's really difficult. And I think the landscape is shifting all the time quickly. It's not, there's no tool where I'm like, I'm going to get this tool and I'm good for the next 10 years. This tool in a year may no longer be valid for different reasons. And when I choose something, for example, my email service, obviously everyone knows one key theme is never use anything that's free ever. Don't use anything that is free. It's likely like a honeypot of some sort. And yeah, stay away from anything that's free. And then we know, you know, Google, Gmail you know, Pentagon mail was going to use, I stopped using that a long time ago. So I was in the market for a private email service. Probably you want to host your own email server. Uh, so anyways, I went with start mail, which comes from start page based in the Netherlands. And this was probably what, almost 10 years ago. One of the, the spokesperson for start mail was Catherine Albrecht. She was very famous back in the day. She was this, she was a Christian. 
so I'm a Christian who share values, right? So you find people who share your values. And she was someone I trusted. She was on my podcast. Um, and she was the spokesperson for Start Page, Start Mail. And I had her on. I, I checked out Start Mail. They seemed good. Start Page. And then a few years pass. And then I sign up to Start Mail, which is what I use, one of my email services that I use. And then I, I see that Catherine disassoci disassociates herself from Start Page. Her and Liz McIntyre, who was her assistant, who was also in my program, they both disassociate from Start Mail. And then you realize, you know, one of the reasons why was some ad company bought like 40, 40, up to 49% in to Start Mail. Start, because the thing is, a lot of these independent tech, as you know, as you probably talked about, they need money. They need capital to, to survive against big tech. And in general, you need money. And so the the market for privacy is is, is low. You know, I, I I've interviewed cypherpunk Paul Rosenberg. He had a VPN company called Crypto Hippie, which I was about to subscribe to, and he sends an email saying, "I've shut it down." There was just not enough interest in privacy, and so you, you could sort of understand why Start Page is, you know, needing money. So they take money from this ad company, and they say it doesn't go against their values because they still maintain the privacy. And so, but I, so I'm, I'm just continuing to use start mail. What am I going to do? Uh, and then I tried the silent circle, like it was a decade ago, former U S Navy seal, uh, Phil Zimmerman, I think who created PGP email encryption. They both were part of the silent circle company, which sold the black phones. I immediately bought, bought two phones, you know, 500 bucks a pop, thousand dollars of the first iteration, black phone one, I think. And they were working with some Spanish company that was dealing with, like, I don't know, the software, the operating system, private OS, I think it was called. And they had a falling out. And so that Black Phone 1, they stopped updating it. It just became a brick. And you see what I'm saying? It's just like every time the, 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 the game board is the shifting. You know, you, you start playing chess, then you know, it switches to Go. And, and, and this is just how it goes. And I'm using a VPN service now which I'm not happy with. So I'm going to, and I think it's also healthy to switch between uh, different services, uh, you know, or, or double up like with VPN. So you're, you don't have to trust one company. You can use a VPN at the router level and then another VPN and a tour on top of that, if you wanted to. So you can have multiple layers. I wanted to, yeah, just a quick response to what you said. I, I definitely understand the struggle of, of privacy companies. I do think there is an appetite for, for privacy stuff. I've, interviewed a lot of people on this show. Standard Notes, for example, I just had an interview with the creator of that. And I think that company is doing well. And the idea is that you have your, your notes that are encrypted at the local level, uploaded to their servers, and then you, you only have the decryption key. And one of the problems with privacy-minded people is that they sometimes just don't believe in advertising, which I think is a mistake. And then you have services like, for example, ExpressVPN, and private internet access to the big VPNs. Sure, they were bought out by a huge company that in the past had actually been, uh, had dealt with like spyware and such. Um, and yet, obviously that's one factor I tell people to consider with the privacy services. But what I trust at the end of the day is the open source code and the third party audits, regular third party, party audits that prove that there's no logging happening um, as well as tests such as the the FBI and and other and other three letter agencies that try to get information and the results come out and and they're negative. My my take is not as bleak a, as yours. L l yeah, let me just add. I I do, I also do use standard notes, so that's great. I'm going to check out that interview uh, you did, and th that's one of the few. Uh, there are a few, and I liked uh, standard notes. I think I bought like a long term license, so when I find products like that. I'll pay whatever, you know, if, if they have a longer term license, it's kind of, as you said, if it's a quality product, I want to pay a lot to use the service, but also to ensure that the company can have success going forward. And I did want to add, add that, you know, one of my sponsors is Above Phone, uh, Ramiro Romani of Take Back Our Tech, and they basically sell D Google phones and then they have a privacy suite because I look for sponsors for my show and sometimes I'll just get pitches, not that often, but I just out of the blue got an email pitching this Converso app. I don't know if you've heard about it, but it's something that's like really new being developed. That's supposed to be like, you know, comparable to Signal, some, but better, right? 
And it's really suspicious, though, because you would think that the powers that be, kind of like what we were talking about earlier with Snowden and the Open Technology Fund, you, you, you might get people posing as, you know, this is the next best app in this area. And I just looked up the, the, the founder and I just got more questions than answers because it's out of the blue. Uh, it was just like some high school kid. He dropped out after two months of at, at MIT or somewhere. And then he started some business, sold it like in a couple of months, all in a couple of months time, like a lot of things that don't add up. Like, how do you just and, and then the way that he speaks as well, it just kind of seems disinterested. Just, you know, how do you get all this money in such a short span of time and make some business in a short span of time and sell it off? And then you're starting Converse. So it's just weird. You know, that makes you think this backing by intelligence agencies. And then and then he's involved with some, again, big pharma, uh, you know, or some some big pharma gene editing uh, sort of type company. And then it's like. I don't trust. It's kind of what you were saying earlier. This Converso app, too many red flags for me. I don't want to have anything to do with it. I don't want them to sponsor my uh, podcast. So it's just interesting to see this these sorts of developments. No, and look, I, I, I always appreciate the skepticism. Things that you have said have have prompted me to to reevaluate uh, the things that I that I trust. So uh, that that's always good. And I'll tell you what: if you're creating a privacy service, um, you've you've got a, a, a an uphill battle to. Uh, to um, satiate skepticism of, of people who are attracted to those services. Shout out to people who have done that, uh, such as Mo from Standard Notes. You've spent a lot of time in Mexico. I know a lot of the people in, in the groups that I frequent and maybe some listeners of the show are interested in exploring Mexico, maybe even living there. Of course, a lot of people are afraid of the narcos situation in, in Mexico, the cartels, etc. What is your basic take on how dangerous Mexico is, if it is, and how to avoid some of that stuff. I mean, I'm still trying to figure out this question being here for over a decade. Uh, but I guess, you know, a simple thing you can ask, one can ask oneself is, I I'm still here. Um, pretty much all of the people that I know, foreigners or Mexicans, are still here, you know, after a decade. So, it can't be that bad. You, you know what I'm saying? The situation versus if you're living in some like Middle Eastern war zone where, you know, you know, everyone who's got a cousin or a kid where they've been maimed or killed. So that's sort of something to bring you down to earth where for the large part, it's not like the media says, especially the American, the Western media. I think part of that scare is to try. It's like Ron Paul said, you know, the border wall is not to keep. Uh, keep uh, migrants from coming in. It's to keep the Americans uh, from leaving, to, to, to keep you in the prison. So that's lately how I'm reading a lot of this stuff is it's to keep people where they are. So that's one basic measurement. You know, I'm, I'm largely fine. My home was broken into three times, but that's because it was not a negated community. And even the thieves themselves don't want to confront you. They, they want to enter your home when you're not there. You know, that aside, um, it is a problematic situation. Uh, I mean, it's like my home of Chicago. Uh, the only time I ever was held up at gunpoint was in Chicago, not in Mexico. And it was on the north side of Chicago. Uh, I happen to be the manager of a supermarket. But again, it's like in Chicago, if you go to the south side, you, there are places you just don't want to go in Chicago. It's the same thing in Mexico. Uh, people were talking with friends this weekend, Michoacan, which I recently visited to check out the Greater Reset uh, Conference. I went to Morelia, the capital of Michoacan, to like the, the western part of Michoacan. Generally, everything's fine there. But then if you go to like another part of Michoacan, it's like total no-go territory. Same thing with Guanajuato. You've got San Miguel de Allende. Uh, you know, James Guzman's there. Uh, a lot of expats think life is beautiful in San Miguel. But then if you go to other parts of Guanajuato, um, it's like, yeah, no-go. And... The, the worst people that are affected are usually people involved in the cartel stuff or people who have seen, like bystanders who saw something they shouldn't have or journalists investigating this um, stuff. But, you know, th there is still a fear from the average criminal of extortion or, or, or kidnapping and that sort of thing, especially if you're wealthier. So you just got to keep your wits uh, about you, try to build a network. Uh, you know, I know people that could I know people who know people who could come to my aid for certain <laughs> issues. Let's let's con conclude with 
a few other high level questions. Building from the last one, if somebody is trying to evaluate, okay, where can I hold out for the next years, the next couple of decades? Maybe they're afraid of some of the stuff we mentioned earlier in the episode. It seems like Mexico might be one of the the later, the latter um, places to fall. What what is your read of where people might consider if they if they have the fears that we have articulated so far? Yeah, it's 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 complicated. In some ways, I think you'll buy more time in places like Mexico. But others, it can come very quickly because I think that technology now can allow the same thing, the same hammer to come down in a both a developed and developing um, country like uh, the U.S. and Mexico. You could have the governor. They're captured, by the way. Um, Alfaro, the governor of Jalisco, where I am, or Samuel Garcia. This, I've been talking about this guy for years. Um, and now others are finally starting to talk about him. I'm like, I've talked about this two years ago. This guy is saying... He's trying to put into place social credit system. He's saying, like, if you insult me online, you know, you straight to jail, like that SNL meme. Uh, he's was at COP27, UN Climate Bank uh, Conference, saying we want to get rid of all private vehicles in Nuevo León. He was just at Davos hanging out with Klaus Schwab, took a photo with him and said he wants Klaus Schwab to invite him to Nuevo León. So they're all penetrated. They're all captured. De facto, it's provable in the court of law. They're there, you got Mexican governors literally carrying out Rockefeller-funded smart city projects. And it's documented. It's like it's not even theory anymore. So I feel like they could just snap their fingers and tomorrow say, okay, no more cash. All businesses must you know, use QR codes and this sort of thing. So I see it that sort of bleakly. That's the scenario possibility. But um, maybe even if that happens across the board, maybe Mexico would have a few more options when it comes to the black market or skirting this system, if you get what I'm saying, maybe a few more than, say, Canada or the U.S. But I also recommend in some instances, you know, maybe it is just better to, to stay where you are. If you're in the U.S. or Canada, if you have a decent sized network, if you're in a rural area, if you're more sustainable, it might just be better to stay there. Um, and, and a lot of these fear projections that we see who knows how long I mean, we could be talking. We could still in 10 years, Gabriel will be talking about <laughs> this stuff. So that's why I tell people, by all means, prep, prepare for the future, but don't totally take your foot out and lose your chance to profit and enjoy the world because there's still a whole lot to enjoy and to learn how to move like you, you can. OK, CBDCs are coming. You can you can learn to profit from that and work within that. And, you know, in my view, the bundling up in in some remote part of the world it just doesn't it do, it does not interest me to be honest even even if i am preserving my life you have a worldview that is certainly anything but mainstream and i think that you're you can say that you've you've had this view before a lot of people because you've been doing this for a while how do you how did you develop that that worldview and better question where do you get the resources whether that's books podcasts videos etc that help you see your the, the different side of the world that you have come to see? It's really uh, wide ranging. So you have to be someone who consumes a lot of uh, knowledge and material in many different formats. And I think reading is foundational. In the 2000s, between Mongolia and Switzerland, there was a space of time where I had a lot of time in the US in the space of a year. And I literally spent thousands of dollars on books mostly through Amazon and read voraciously. And that established, you know, I'm talking about, you know, nonfiction books dealing with all these subjects that I talk about. And I, I got to eventually got to meet and talk to many of those authors, but that establishes like your foundational base. And once you get that core knowledge, uh, then you build on it much more quicker. So you have to be someone who's widely read. I mean, I see other people in the podcast space and it's clear uh, their takes are a bit, uh, amateur or cartoonish precisely because they're not well read they can't discuss th or approach this stuff at a more sophisticated level i mean i'll see i'll see some podcasters with the same guests that I've, I've had where they're like still discussing level one stuff and i'm already with the guests at level five even the guests themselves will tell me like i like coming on your show because you're already like at the cutting edge you know <laughs> like we're already talking about what's going to happen uh, meanwhile other guys are like talking about like level one but um and then i consume um uh, everything, you know, books, 
I like a lot of newsletters I, I subscribe to, which, you know, some I'll spend more time. Others are useful just for scanning headlines, uh, doc, uh, documentaries, podcasts, interviews. I, I, I really don't watch TV or, or Hollywood films. Like uh, I, I realize for, I, I haven't watched one for like five years. Uh, let's see newsletters. Um, I subscribe to a bunch, but for uh, geopolitical news, um, well, there's one called, it's, it's run by David S. Maxwell. What's it called? Inform Informal Institute for National Security Thinkers and Practitioners. And it's more mainstream defense stuff. But again, you have to know what they are thinking. You know, I like Paul Craig Roberts, his, his newsletter. He, he sends a few pieces daily. Uh, Michael Recknewald's CLG News. And uh, I mean, there's just uh, <laughs> so many, but those are William Ramsey investigates. Uh, I, I liked his stuff. They just took him down from YouTube. He's been a guest of mine. Uh, I just learned about a new one called Tommy's podcast. He gets, uh, I, I'm kind of, I, I still listen to Alex uh, Jones. Um, who else? You know, Dr. Mercola has got a lot of great guests on, but you got to go to BitChute. Um, the Corbett Report? Of course, yeah. The, you know, that's the thing. There's so many and there's not, and I don't listen to all of them consistently, you know, because there's just so much content. So I'll, I'll listen to Corbett once in a while, and then I'll listen to this or that. You know, I, I can't go through them all. And so, but basically I've, I've created a huge system of bookmarks and uh, email lists that I subscribe to and, and email folders and everyone creates their own system to be able to manage such a huge amount of information as, as quickly as possible. Right. We need to get you one of these neural links, Jorge, so that we can, so you can speed up your learning. No, no side effects, right? Right. But you know, I uh, just reminded me, uh, Richard Grove of Grand Theft World, he's amazing. And he's actually, if you watch it, he shows on his, on his screen. Uh, he's got some program. Uh, I've, I've downloaded it. Uh, I haven't really been able to, had time to set it up, but it's some program that allows them to create this like web, uh, this uh, like a conceptual visual web, uh, which links to all of these different books and themes and sources. And so he's able to pull up quickly some topic and then it's linked to all of the sources where, you, you, you know what I'm saying? He's able in that way to manage just so much information so uh, quickly. And so, yeah, that's something uh, that's... Uh, Impress, impressive until the neural link comes out you mean yeah and then and then and then we are uh we're screwed up although i'm not, I'm not quite you know I, I interviewed jj cooey not long ago who's a biology guy and he's like that that stuff's not gonna work i mean like they've tried to put what was it like human heads you know transplant human heads or pig pig parts and it never works because the body recognize it gets infected and then the person dies you know and so interesting the, 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 they were like boring holes into monkeys or pigs with the neural link thing. And then if you try to do it in a human, you know, it, it won't work because it'll, you, your scholars, whatever head is going to get infected and, and reject the foreign <laughs> object. Yeah. I've, I've, I've heard that it might not be uh, inevitability by any means. Let me, let me end with uh, two questions. First of all, what are some underrated agendas in the world that even skeptical people should be paying more attention to? Oh, that's a tough one. Um, well, of latest concern for me has been in the alternative media space and independent media space. And this is more a spiritual thing or esoteric where a lot of these people 10, 20 years ago, you know, freedom fighters, anti-establishment, anti-globalist, like we all have a lot in common, left or right, which on their surface seemed, you know, good, great. But now I'm starting to see a greater thread that psychological operations are being, they're underway in alternative and independent media. And I'm becoming more and more distrustful or, or, or just more um, vetting more of the people that I'm listening to because I'm detecting this sort of occultist, theosophic, new age, pagan, which would ultimately be satanic thread. A, a newsletter I subscribe to, Lu Lucis Trust, uh, which is, you know, Lu Lucifer Trust. And they're part of the UN. 
they uh, founded by Alice Bailey, uh, theosophist, uh, occultist, Satanist. They believe Lucifer is the Messiah. I mean, it's all documented there. And so, um, again, a lot of what they believe overlaps with increasingly what alt media is behind the scenes sort of discussing. So th that's sort of like, and, and James Lindsay is well known. James Lindsay, the atheist, I guess mathematical guy who's got a huge following he's starting to come out and talk about this he gave a great series of lectures saying that we've been run by this esoteric hermetic cult which has now you know marxism is basically an expression of this uh, that's been with us and this matches up with my biblical worldview um and he's saying that they you know the science and economics and politics like wokeism and all this stuff they've gone in into those regions and so a lot of what the the stuff that they're pushing on us now, it's basically it's it's it, it's it's this esoteric occult that's that's been you know they've gone into the areas of science, economics, and 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 politics. So yeah, even James Lindsay is talking about this, and he's saying in his recent lecture from a couple of weeks ago that we have to be able to to discern these things, and you've got these people talking Christianese. When in fact they're the opposite, they're satanic occultists, and I'm noticing alt media folks who say they're Christian, yet they never say one thing ever that's Christian, and they're all talking one one is some um, new age occult stuff. You see what I'm saying? So I think we have to be <laughs> more and more discerning when it comes to the information that we're uh, taking in. That's interesting. Um, uh, just a l less of a I guess less less of a hot take. It, it's certainly true that. When people start disbelieving in traditional God, they start trying to find alternatives, God on earth, right? Uh, whether that's psychology or, or some kind of lifestyle or, or something like this. On that topic, final question, let's get into, speaking of religious, let's get into eschatology. So you're a religious guy, you're a Christian. And so let me try this question with you. In Revelations, it speaks of the Antichrist that people start to follow, even worship, and there are certain attributes of of the Antichrist. I always I always thought uh, on the topic it seemed a little bit strange that we could have this written down, and if it happened, that people would still follow this person, right? That's clearly the, the Antichrist. And then what struck me recently was that what if the Antichrist was an AI, and you know we we go to it and it has all the answers, right? It finds the cure for cancer in one second. It answers metaphysical questions with unshakable logic. It can read people's minds and answer the questions immediately. It's it's this wealth of knowledge that, I don't know, it, it, it opens people's mind in a, in, in a crazy way. Do you think there's any validity to that theory or I'm, I often left field here? No, I mean, I think in this space, you have to be open-minded and lay out all of these potential scenarios. And and, and I'm, I view with disdain a lot of, you know, the traditional Christians in this field, which I think give a bad name, uh, you know, all this left behind stuff. I don't believe in a rapture, uh, you know, the, in the book of Matthew, it says there will come a tribulation first where believers and non-believers alike are going to suffer, even be put to death. So um, I think it's, it's very well may be, as you said, AI, it makes a lot of sense. And I think it's a little bit I mean, we, we could be in the very last days. We may not be. I mean, technically, we have been for the last 2,000 years, but you know what I mean, like the very, very, very last uh, days. So it could be AI. Um, it could be other things. I don't stick with you know one thing, like these people who make predictions to specific years, which I think is totally absurd. <laughs> no one knows the exact time. We can sort of tell the weather, you know, when Christ says, um, just like, you know, you can see it's starting to get cloudy, you know, it's going to rain. So we can see a lot of these things beginning to form, but I, I think more to the point will be when we re when that start when the stuff starts getting rolled out, that's when the people who know will realize it, and the the people who don't will be fooled by it. It also talks about the deceptions getting so great towards the later days that even believers will almost be deceived. You saw many churches with the pandemic. I, I think that was a perfect example where. A number of churches shut down or forced congregants to wear masks or use vaccine passports. And so that just shows, you know, some of the churches are not strong. They're weak. Others, of course, spoken. This is all prophecy. You know, Christ talks about how he he's admonishes the churches in the later days because 
they're becoming weak. Some are false, many false churches. Uh, and so the deception gets greater very well, maybe an AI. Uh, and I think maybe an antichrist figure would be, he would not come as some Hitler or Stalin. I mean, he would come as, it would be someone coming. We, we have this whole great reset, Klaus Schwab, New World Order vision of this dark, you know, New World Order. It might be someone who comes and destroys, you know, the Klaus Schwab World Economic Forum thing. And we might think, oh, look, this person's a savior. When that, in fact, you know, might be the <laughs> actual uh, Antichrist. In, in conclusion, Herr Boyer, where can people find you, listen to you? What's the best way? Obviously, we'll have all these links in the description. Yeah, basically, you go to the HQ. I mean, this is the way when I find people I listen to, I just go to their headquarters. And from there, I, I find all their other stuff. So the podcast website is geopoliticsandempire.com. And you, you want to go there directly. I still don't understand people who will, I'll give them the address, and then they're going to type it into Google search. And I'm blacklisted on Google Google, Google search. And so, um, and tntradio.live, you'll find my presenter page. Uh, there. And then I'm very active on Telegram and Twitter, but I'm also posting on MeWe, Float, Minds, Gab, uh, Getter. I can't even remember them uh, all. And yeah, I've got for donations, people can pay to consult with me. And uh, I have a member option, which is mostly people becoming members as a way to donate and support me. I've been really haven't produced enough member content. I've just been overwhelmed. But I, I do do a monthly Zoom call with members where we just privately, we just connect and just shoot the breeze for a few hours. Uh, and I'm, I'm trying to get back to making weekly, uh, just my solo rants for like, you know, 20 minutes a week, just throw uh, my, my thoughts out uh, into audio. And so, yeah, that's where I am. Well, as, as you were talking, I, I went to Google and yeah, your your website's nowhere to be seen, but I, I'm using DuckDuckGo by default, so it came up first. So um, plus one in this case for DuckDuckGo, but in other cases, Yandex and other search engines are the best place to accurately find things if you need to search and you don't need to go directly to the URL, which is always preferred. Here, Voye, thank you so much for being on the Watchman Privacy Podcast. Thanks for having me. And you know, maybe some of the stuff I said was a little out there or esoteric or beyond the, the Overton window. But hey, you know, that it is what it is. Thanks for having me. <laughs>